Hello. Hey. Just make sure that we're live. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Are you there? It's Monday night. Do you know where your explorers are? They're on Zoom, of course, or traveling somewhere around the world. It's June 21st. It is the summer solstice. It's also a day known as Fête de la Musique. And in New York City, it's known as Make Music Day in New York. This is the day when there's music in the streets, music everywhere, music all over the world. We celebrate music. And so here at the Explorers Club online, we're celebrating musical explorers, explorers who are musicians, some exploring with their music, some working on music while they're exploring. It's really amazing people are here tonight. And I believe this is going to be the first of a new series of music-based events that's going to happen at the club, which is going to be opening in person soon. So welcome everybody. Most of our explorers are presenting videos, some made just today of their explorations in music in different ways and places and times around the world. I'd like to begin with one of my own. It's a video I made playing music live with birds, birds down the street from where I live on the Dawn Chorus last month. And in a time where we weren't able to travel as far as we usually travel, I just went down the street at a time I usually don't get up really early and, and join in with this famous dawn chorus of birds singing, making all kinds of sounds. So welcome everybody, here it is.
Okay, is it over? Did it end? I can't tell because you... It did, it did. Okay, all right, so I went just down the street to explore, but our next participant is right now in Greenland. Martin Nuia and Pamela Peters are on an expedition right now. And they made just the other day this special presentation for everybody. And... Uh, Martin Nuia, this guy does so many things, you know. I always thought he was the dentist in Sharon, Connecticut, who was a world expert on the narwhal tusk, which is just an amazing combination of interests. And, and yet he's also a composer of music for eight PBS documentaries. The first PBS show for mainland China, he wrote music for the opening of the Waikiki Aquarium in Hawaii. And he's uh, two of his compositions with well-known Hawaii musicians are part of the historic collection in Hawaii. And so he's done all these things and he's still in the Arctic studying narwhals and putting all kinds of things together. And what he did just a few days ago is make this very special presentation just for this event, a performance by the Umanak Children's Home directed by Anne Andreasen. And she's also a member of the Explorers Club. So here is the Umanak Children's Home choir and musicians direct from Greenland right now. Take it away. Oh, my God. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Martin and Pamela for making that just for this event. And uh, everyone you hear, everyone you're gonna see in these videos tonight is gonna join us at the end for a little conversation. Although Martin and Pamela say they're out on a boat trip, not sure if they'll get back in time, but we hope they will and we'll get to see them. Uh, next, we have uh, several videos from Elon Moss. He's a fellow of the Explorers Club, and he's combined his passion for traditional music from around the world with his day job in global health. And he has a particularly love for the obscure, rootsy, and raw traditional music found in remote and hard to reach places from the Appalachian Mountains to the upper reaches of the Congo River. So take it away, Elon. Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Ilan Moss, je suis explorateur, membre euh, des clubs des explorateurs et bienvenue à notre euh, soirée de la fête de la musique. So, uh, welcome, my name is Ilan Moss, that was in French because um, I'm about to play you a French song on the accordion and of course the fête de la musique started in France um, as really a global uh, celebration of music from around the world, obviously of French music. and I had the privilege to live in France for about a decade where every night, the 21st of June, there'd be bands playing in front of every cafe um, and hopefully that's going to start up next year. But to kick off our night, I am going to play uh, a French waltz for you. Um, this is uh, La Valse des Irondes. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, Elon has got the spirit of the origin of Fête de la Musique right there for us. Uh, we're going to hear more from him very soon. Now, Martin and Pamela were in the Arctic and Cheryl Leonard has been in the Antarctic. She's a composer, performer, field recordist and instrument builder. She makes works that explore sounds, structures and objects from the natural world interweaving sounds played on stones, wood, water, ice, sand, shells, feathers, and bones. She mixes these with field recordings from remote locations. Her recent projects focus on the extinction of species and climate change in the polar regions and also California, where she's from. The first video is a kind of talk and presentation, and the second one, she's playing some very interesting things instruments you've never seen before, I guarantee it. So enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Cheryl Leonard and it's great to be here today to celebrate the summer solstice, music and exploration. I am a composer, performer and instrument builder. I make works investigating natural environments and ecosystems and human relationships to them. I'm interested in what we can learn from listening to the world more closely. And I use microphones to enable me to access unique sounds, sounds that might be too quiet to be noticed normally, 
or above or below our human hearing range. And I'm using these microphones to make field recordings and to amplify sounds from natural materials that I play as musical instruments. I combine my love of weird sounds and music with a passion for the wilderness and boots on the ground exploration. To make projects about environmental issues with the focus on climate change and extinction of species. My goal is to inspire others to perceive the world in new ways and to rethink our relationship with the earth. So today, let's go to Antarctica, where of course it is the winter solstice, not the summer solstice. So in 2008-2009, I spent five weeks at Palmer Research Station as a participant in the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. I went there to collect materials to make music about the Antarctic Peninsula and the scientific research happening there. Palmer Research Station is on Anvers Island. It's the smallest year-round U.S. research station on the continent, with a summer population of around 40 people, and is home to a long-term ecological research site. When I was there, I went out into the field every day to gather materials to make music with. I did a lot of field recording. I recorded the sounds of wildlife, wind, water, and of course the ice. And the ice made so many wonderful sounds. From the booming calving glaciers to dripping icicles inside a crevasse to clinking, clanking, clunking bits of floating ice to weird mechanical or percussive sounds coming from meltwater streams on the surface of the glacier. The ice never failed to disappoint me with its musicality. I also collected natural objects to use to make musical instruments out of. With a permit, I collected Adelie penguin bones and nesting stones, Antarctic limpet shells, and I now have a fine collection of musical rocks from Antarctica. After returning home to my studio here in San Francisco, I sorted through all of my materials to figure out what I could use to make music. I listened back to all of the field recordings, picked out the sections that I felt had musical elements already embedded in them, and then I put on my mad scientist hat and did experiments with my natural objects to see what kinds of unique sounds they could produce. Some of them I played as is, but others I constructed into sculptural instruments. I tried out a range of playing techniques, tapping, rubbing, bowing, and I played around with amplifying them with different kinds of microphones. Here are some of the Antarctic instruments I've built. These are mostly made out of penguin bones mounted in driftwood, but there are also some limpet shells there. And then it was time to make actual compositions. So I combined the field recordings with my favorite sounds I had discovered on the natural objects. And I crafted pieces that had themes that connected to climate change and research in the region. And I made pieces that are designed to be performed live in front of an audience. Today, I'm gonna to share with you a piece called Point Eight Ice. Point Eight is a little protrusion of bare rocky land that's east of Palmer Station. One day I went out there and put my hydrophones in the water next to a few small pieces of floating ice that the waves were rocking back and forth. The composition that I made grows out of rhythms and melodic fragments contained in that original field recording. I then developed and expanded on these patterns and added in ice-like sounds from some of my Antarctic instruments. What you'll hear in the field recording part is mainly the ice melting and the little pieces bumping into each other. This ice had calved off the massive glacier that covers Anvers Island the Mar Ice Piedmont. It's very old ice. It's been up there for hundreds to thousands of years. 
and as it melts, little pockets of ancient air that have been trapped inside are released, and they make these crazy popping, snapping, crackling sounds, kind of like giant rice krispies. Like most of the glaciers on the western Antarctic Peninsula, the Mar Ice Piedmont is shrinking. Its surface is increasingly fractured by exposed crevasses, and along its periphery, great masses of ice calve off into the ocean during the austral summer. When I was there, it calved quite frequently, except of course when I was trying to record it, and that was way back in 2009, so I can only imagine how active it is now. The instruments that you'll see me playing are the limpet shell spine. These are 10 Antarctic limpet shells mounted in driftwood. And the octobone, eight Adelie penguin bones mounted in driftwood. The Adelie penguins are longtime residents of this part of Antarctica. Unfortunately, their colonies near Palmer Station are rapidly collapsing as the climate warms and the sea ice diminishes. They're being replaced by gentoos and chinstraps, penguins that are adapted to more sub-Antarctic conditions. Because I'm working with really unusual sounds, I had to invent my own system of music notation in order to compose these pieces and make it possible to rehearse and perform them. The top two lines of the instrumental parts, so we have the octobones on top, the limpet shells underneath, and the bottom line is the field recording ice part. Without further ado, here is point eight ice. Thank you for listening.
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. You've shown us, really showing us how exploration, travel, can. You guys still there? Thanks, Cheryl. You've really shown us how exploration and travel to remote and unusual places can attune us to sounds that we might never have thought previously to pay attention to. Crackle of ice, instruments made out of shells and bones, making a music out of the strange and unusual experiences you've had. And I myself have traveled many places. I've played a lot of music with whales and listened to a lot of strange sounds made by whales and other underwater animals. But one of the most interesting trips of that type I did was to the Dominican Republic to work with teenagers who couldn't hear anything. They were deaf. They could only feel the whale songs coming from speakers or they would study their structure. And we got them singing along with things they couldn't even hear by understanding what was under the sea, getting into sound without hearing sound. So I'd like to show a little clip of that experience right now. Hi there, hope you guys are enjoying this show of uh, La Fête La Musique. So um, I'm back with you guys, my name is Elon Moss and uh, normally my job I work um, in the field of neglected tropical disease research. So normally I'm traveling around the world trying to raise awareness about some horrible neglected tropical diseases like sleeping sickness or Chagas disease um, or river blindness. But unfortunately I'm grounded like everyone else. Um, so I'm not able to travel. And when I travel, I always take recordings. I always record uh, some of the amazing musicians that I meet um, in Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America. So unfortunately that's over for now. Um, you can visit my recordings at www.globaltradmusic.com. Um, I've been using that as a repository for all my uh, recordings from around the world. Um, but I'm gonna talk about a more a local exploration. And just two weeks ago, I was in uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina. This is on the border of Virginia and North Carolina at the Mount Airy Fiddlers Convention. Um, this is one of the oldest fiddlers conventions in the US. Um, and this is where you'll find amazing fiddlers and banjo players in the Appalachian old time style. Now this music is really a pure product of exploration and travel. Um, it was brought over from the, by the Scots-Irish immigrants um, to the Appalachian Mountains a long time ago in the 18th century. Um, and then it, it mixed with local, uh, with, uh, with you know, other immigrant cultures, um, German, Swiss, 
uh, French, but most importantly, it's where the African American influence came in um, to change the rhythm up of these Scots Irish tunes and uh, make them more syncopated and bring in instruments like the banjo. But the main instrument behind this music is the fiddle. Um, so now I'm going to play you a tune um, from the old time tradition from uh, Surrey County, where I w was just two weeks ago. Um, this is a very rhythmic version of Breaking Up Christmas, which is a, a tune that you'll hear all over Surrey County around Christmas time. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elon. He'll be back one more time. Some more music from his travels. Our next presenter is Ken Lakovara. You might have heard his and seen his TED talk that millions of people have watched. He's a paleontologist, director of a new dinosaur museum. He has discovered some of the world's largest and most amazing dinosaurs, including the super giant Dreadnoughtus. It is so important a discovery. It's going to be featured in next year's Jurassic World sequel. Hollywood could not ignore such a dinosaur. One thing we might not have known about Ken Lakabara is that he was formerly the house drummer at the Golden Nugget Casino in Atlantic City. And often if you talk to him on the phone, he's actually sitting behind his drum set tending to be doing scientific research, but he's actually thinking about playing the drums and he's prepared a whole video explaining what he is up to right now. Hey, Ken Lacovara here, paleontologist, explorers club medalist, and director of the Edelman Fossil Park Museum of Rowan University. And I wanted to talk about my life in music as an expeditioner. I take a pair of sticks with me everywhere I go, and almost always I can find a way to sit in with a band, to kind of get immersed in the local culture, and it is just a great way to travel. And I wanted to tell you some of those stories this evening. Um, for a couple of winters, I spent my time in the Bahariya Oasis of Egypt, which is halfway between the Nile and, and Libya, halfway between the Mediterranean and Sudan, so basically nowhere. And we were digging up giant dinosaurs. Uh, that is where we discovered the the giant beast, a new species at the time uh, that I named Paralititan, uh, which means tidal giant. At the time, it was the second largest known dinosaur. And every night for months, uh, for several winters, I would go to what we call the Bedouin Happy Hut. It was uh, this uh, giant tent, all men, of course, uh, Bedouins who were traveling through the oasis. And every night we would play drums together and some of them would dance. And this is the traditional uh, Egyptian drum. It's called a, a tabla. And uh, they have something that I would call a national beat. Every man, every boy knows how to play. So 
So we would play this in a group and kind of like a drum circle. Other Bedouins would dance and we would play this beat for hours, literally hours with no variation. And eventually I would say like, you know, and I could speak a little Arabic at the time, like, well, why don't we try a little something different? How about if we like mix it up? Like, and they would look at me very confused and they would say, la la la, this is the beat. And I would say, yeah, I know that's the beat, but maybe we could try a little something different. And that made no sense to them. And finally it dawned on me that in the West and in the United States, you know, music is a form of self-expression. That's how we tell people who we are. Um, for the Bedouins, it was a means of belonging to the group and that social conformity that they were exhibiting with the national beat, that told everybody we're part of the group and we're with you. So, is the beat. And you're gonna play that all night long. Um, another time, I was in, um, I was in China, in, uh, in Western China, in a little town called Changma, which looks kind of like an Asian shire, uh, very uh, primitive town, no mechanized equipment for farming. Women are out there with their scythes, hand broadcasting wheat. And I heard this very strange noise coming through the town early in the morning, at like five in the morning, and I, I got out of bed and I went down into the street, lots of dogs barking and I saw a Chinese funeral band uh, proceeding through the street and I went up and I started, um, I could speak a little bit of Mandarin, I started talking to them and uh, a guy gave me a stick and a cymbal. And uh, it was a kind of a cymbal like this. And I started helping them keep time as they processed down the street. Um, I did a lot of work in, um, in southernmost Patagonia. That is where I discovered the giant dinosaur Dreadnoughtus, uh, which I just found out will be in the next Jurassic World movie, so I'm pretty psyched about that. Uh, Dreadnoughtus in life was 65 tons. That's nine times the mass of a T-Rex, the mass of 13 bull African elephants, about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. And in this little town that we would base ourselves out of, El Calafate, and I spent six winters there, um, there's an Irish bar, and at the Irish bar, there's a U2 cover band. And so I went in there one night, and uh, I end up on stage, and they say, uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Well, I, I wasn't really a huge U2 fan, and, and I, I didn't own this music, but, I, but it has a very catchy intro, and fortunately, I remembered the beat, and it goes something like this. for a few days. We are walking down the uh, Isle de Floridia and uh, he has to make a phone call. And while he's off making the phone call, I spot this group of street musicians, this little band, and I walk up to them and I start talking a little bit. And uh, pretty soon, I'm playing with a band. When my grad student comes back with his phone call, I'm in the street playing something like this. gathering in um, Avalon, France. And uh, there's a great musician there. He's a well-known um, uh, Lithuanian musician, Jurgis uh, Dizioulis. And uh, Jurgis is a fine guitar player, mandolin player, singer, songwriter. So he's in there playing uh, with another guy who's on grand piano. And I think, well, you know, I want a piece of this. And so uh, 
I don't have a drum with me and I don't even have any sticks. So I start wandering around this chateau and I go into the kitchen and I find this big box. It's almost like uh, something you'd put a, a washing machine in. Um, I don't have a box that big with me, but really any box can be an instrument. That's one of the great things about drumming. So um, they, I, I look at them, they kind of give me the high sign and I start, uh, you know, I start playing with them. And so this is going on for maybe 20 minutes. And then this other guy comes up and he starts sort of like tapping on my box. And I'm like, well, this guy's tapping on my box. <laughs> um, but after a few more minutes, I hear like, oh, he's got rhythm. So that's cool. Okay, we can play. And then it occurs to me like, did he just play what I played? So I switch it up. And he plays that. And I switch it up again. And he plays that. And I'm like, okay, it's on. This guy can really play. So now we're jamming. And this goes on for another half hour. By this time, there's a crowd of maybe 50, 75 people around. They're dancing. The band is rocking. It's going really well. We both look at each other. And at the same moment, we know it's time to end the song. So we take the heels of our hand and, and together, we smash through the box. The song ends. Everybody cheers. We get up, we hug each other. And I say, hi, I'm Ken Wackelware. I'm a paleontologist. And he says, I'm Chris Wink. I'm the founder of the Blue Man Group. <laughs> and Chris is a great guy. We've become uh, friends since then. He's actually been to the Explorers Club where we played on boxes. Um, I was in Madrid one time and it's about three o'clock in the morning and uh, me and this other guy, we find a jazz club uh, called Barco. And I've learned uh, that all you have to do when you're anywhere in the world is just say, I'm a jazz drummer from Philadelphia. And they say, let's go. Uh, so I get up there on stage and the first thing they wanna play is um, Dave Brubeck's Take Five, which has this iconic drum entry. So that's a lot of fun. And then they want to play Charlie Parker's uh, Bloom Dido, which also has a really great entry. It goes something like this. And by the end of the night, we're just cruising with straight ahead, open bebop, about 300 uh, beats per minute. <laughs> Since then, uh, since I can't drag a box with me everywhere I go, um, I got this thing. And it's actually called box. It's the Spanish word cajon, which is just Spanish for box. And it's great. This is actually made out of beetle kill pine from Colorado. So trees that the beetles unfortunately killed, but um, they turned it into something good here. And it has different bases on it that make different sounds, and I kind of take this thing everywhere I go now, and it's been incredibly useful, and so I can jam with just about anybody with this thing now. You can do something like this. my life um, expeditioning with a pair of drumsticks. Hope you enjoyed it. Hi again, I'm back and this time I have my banjo with me. It's appropriate I have a banjo because uh, this Friday or last Friday was Juneteenth and you might not know it but the banjo is an actual instrument of African origin. 
Um, the banjo, well, not the actual banjo, but when enslaved Africans were brought to the U.S., um, they weren't allowed to bring instruments. So they recreated an instrument that was found in West, that is still found in West Africa, called the akunting, which has a smaller string. It sort of looks like this. It has a smaller string, which is called the chanterelle um, in America, which means little singer in France. That's what it is. And they played it in this distinct style of wrapping it and then plucking the little, um, the little string here. Um, so they weren't able to bring instruments, but they created their own. Um, and in the plantations of Virginia and North Carolina, the banjo was born a long time ago um, in the 17th century. Um, and it was obviously refined, frets were added, then Europeans, uh, Europeans and Americans um, took up the instrument and it became America's instrument. It's, I think it's really the only instrument that was developed in the US. Um, and um, it's my favorite instrument to play. Um, it's fitting because uh, last uh, few weeks ago, as I said earlier, I was at the Mount Airy Fiddlers Convention. There's great banjo, banjo, there's, there's great banjo players there that play in this, this amazing style of wrapping the banjo. Um, but in my travels, I was, I've been lucky to bring the banjo back to Africa. Um, in fact, my last trip to Africa or to Central Africa, which is in, which was in June, no, it was in December 2019, um, you know, right before the uh, poop hit the fan, um, I was able to bring my banjo to Uganda and play with some local musicians. I didn't have that much time, but I had one afternoon um, off of work. I met some friends and I was able to play with a uh, musician from Uganda um, who was playing a harp, um, sort of a, uh, you'll see it in the video, which I'm gonna, we're gonna show in a couple of seconds. It's a, it's a handheld harp. And then another instrument called the umduri, which is found in Uganda, but also in Burundi, played by my friend Alexander. Um, and I was able to play the banjo and we played this tune that's pretty popular in uh, Rwanda and Uganda. And here it is. Some of you might recognize it's also found in Brazilian music. And my friend George playing harp, and he's from uh, Kampala, Uganda. So now I'm gonna play you a tune. Um, this is a tune from West Virginia um, called Sandy Boys. Um, and I learned this at a festival in West Virginia um, in near Beckley, West Virginia, really near the New River Gorge, beautiful area, where there's another fiddler's convention where I've been lucky to meet some of the older banjo players from that area and learn that style. So here it is, here's Sandy Boys.
enjoyed that, uh, thank you and stay tuned and we'll be all joining you really soon. Have a great night. Thanks so much, Elon. You really see in your, in your travels how the banjo is so related to these African instruments like the unguni and the kora. And just to, to take it there in the midst of all the other work you're doing and play with musicians, you really see how exploration is essential for the spread and change of music. And Ken, you know, it's amazing to, to really hear how much that dinosaurs love drums. And I guess you just play the drums and they emerge from their, from their ancient graves and start to dance or something like that. And um, I'm fortunate that, that I'm just playing with little birds like nightingales, they're in Europe, not here. Last year we couldn't go anywhere. So I tried to think what could I do that would be really different than going and playing live with these nightingales in Berlin, which is where I often go. So I said, let's do something remote where I'll play clarinet from here and the nightingales will be singing and live and a totally different time of day. My friend Rob Thorne, a Maori musician in Aotearoa, New Zealand, he's gonna play traditional Maori wind instruments and percussion kind of music called tango poro. So we mixed this all together live, we played live, we all were tapping into the live singing nightingale. And here's a video made from the footage there in Berlin and us playing New Zealand, New York, Berlin, live with the nightingale, thanks.
We are live. Go. All right. Thank you, Alex and Luis. The technology has not failed us. It's all working. We saw these amazing musical stories from around the world. Most of you who made these videos and these journeys are here. And now we can talk about this. We can really see just what does music have to do with exploration at all? I think we've got a lot of evidence of what it has to do with. So maybe we're all live, maybe not, I'm not sure, but hopefully soon. Are we live? Everyone unmuted? I, do you get to unmute yourselves or? Um, I'm seeing life turning around here. Everybody there? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Welcome the whole crew of musical explorers on Fête de la Musique, Make Music Day. And uh, I think we've, we've got a lot of evidence here. Music's very important to exploration and to explorers. And uh, a lot of questions have come in. And that's one of the most basic questions. You know, what, is, um, I mean, what does exploration mean for music? Somebody asked. How is music dependent on exploration? We just have three of us here or are there more? The rest of you can turn on your videos. So uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, for me being a, a paleontologist and a geologist, what do I do? I explore time. And, you know, as a drummer, that's what I do also. And so uh, in my profession, I explore, you know, vast tracts of time. And then in my application here, I explore little tiny segments of time, uh, but it's all related. And so day and night, I'm really thinking about time and how time relates to itself and the, the relative dimensions of time. And, and so I find that the one helps the other. And do, do the rhythms of drumming, these short-term repeating rhythms, help you understand the vast long rhythms of geological eons and eras and, and the paleo paleontological units of time? Do, do they actually come together in your mind in some way? They do sometimes. And so, um, you know, just like with um, pitched instruments, um, you, you see resonances and there are certain geological phenomena in which you see residences. There's, there's a set of astronomical periodicities called the Milankovitch cycles that have to do with the orbital eccentricity of the earth, the axial tilt and the direction that the axis is tilting in space. And those cycles are roughly 100,000, 44,000 and 22,000 years. And when you plot them out, you, you start to see you get harmonics periodically, and they can trigger ice ages then and, and interglacial periods because of the amount of solar radiation. And it's very similar to, you know, if you're playing drums, if you play like three against four, if you have like four going on there and then you put three against it. And you can see in this, it's a very short segment, right? But you get a resonance on every third count and in between they're doing different things. So similar. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Cheryl, there's some, uh, quite a few questions for you. And one of them was, uh, what's the most beautiful sound you've come across in your travels? Well, it's hard to pick just one, of course. Uh, one of my favorite sounds was the sound of the southern elephant seals that I heard when I was down at Palmer Station. And one night I camped out on this island and I was there alone with the elephant seals. And they, uh, they were swimming in this cove and the cove was surrounded by glacial ice. Uh, so it was reflecting the sound. And in the evening, these were juvenile males and they were wrestling with each other. They were doing practice fighting for mating season. And so they're howling and grunting and their sounds are just reflecting off the ice with these incredible echoes. So that was one of my favorite moments of sound. Cool. And, and so what, what's the difference between just recording sounds in the field of, of uh, seals and ice and then turning them into music? Do you think differently when you're like collecting the material and then you, you transform it into art or is it kind of some sort of continuum? Well, sometimes the sounds as they are don't need to be made into music because they're already so wonderful. And other times I feel like it's interesting to have a dialogue with those sounds um, that I could add some of my instrumental sounds in conversation with what the natural world is presenting me, similar to what you do in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are times when it's appropriate to do either, uh, and you just want to be respectful of the original material and experience. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I think that uh, I would never think like this, the sound needs me to do something to it. Right. Like, fine as it is, but what interests me as a musician is, to get musical ideas from this material, to see how it changes the way I think. And for me, you know, I'm always looking for a different sense of what music could be. And I think um, I'm always impressed by the, the, the ideas of Pauline Oliveros and John Cage to listen better, just take it all in, listen more carefully. So many more things can be music and you just have to be open to it. I want my sense of music to be changed by the places I go, where I travel, what I happen to listen to. I wonder if there are others of you have that idea. Do you, does your sense of music change through your exploration and traveling? Do you have a different sense of what music could be? Any, Elon, do you have any sense of that? Like, Have you gotten interested in different kinds of music because of the places you've been? Yeah, you can hear me okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you know, when I'm traveling, obviously it's, you know, it depends. I'm usually in a, in a bigger group with colleagues. Um, most of them aren't musicians, they're doctors or, um, you know, uh, medical workers or even, um, you know, neglected, ne neglected disease researchers. So, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's pr pretty or much a ragtag group of folks. Um, but, They've actually, you know, over the years, I think people have learned that if they go with me, then they'll end up getting some good music. Um, so, you know, often before we go, people ask me, well, you know, what have you planned this time? I think the biggest surprise for me was Sudan. Um, I mean, Sudan's famous in the music world, um, uh, especially for a lot of the music that came out of Sudan in the 70s and the 80s. Um, you know, it's like Ethiopian music. It's got that, you know, pentatonic five note scale so and it's mixed with, you know with more arabic uh, rhythms and it's absolutely fantastic stuff um i was kind of ignorant about it um i you know i'd heard about the records and i you know obviously ethiopian music is you know really hit the world music circuit in the 90s um so you know showing up there we were working on um pretty neglected disease that you sort of find um south of khartoum which is the capital um, and obviously Sudan was famous also for, you know, decades under a pretty hardcore Islamicist government that banned all the music. So um, it was, I wasn't really expecting to see much, but um, only after a few days I started talking with folks and they told me about a club where all the musicians hang out. And apparently there's been a huge revival in sort of this old style orchestra driven um, pop music, which is absolutely fantastic. You have a couple of accordions, a bunch of fiddles, oud, um, some other instruments and up to, you know, four to five singers. And it's 
absolutely fantastic stuff all in this this pentatonic scale for those musicians out there um so it sort of sounds like ethiopian music um and on my nights off um i was able to go to this club and made friends with a bunch of the musicians did some recording uh with that of them and then ended up playing because they also play the accordion there so someone got a hold of an accordion they don't the egyptians will often um they'll so to get the quarter tones on the accordion they'll shave off the reeds um so it you know it's not in the western scale but the sunnis keep it um usually keep it to, to you know tuned to a western scale so i was a play i was able to play the accordion and fell in love with sudanese music and then bought some records there actually um from the 70s and then posted them on social media and then realized afterwards that for this sought after currency and record collectors i had some djs and in, in the uk offering me money for some of my sudanese records i had no clue so yeah, um, sometimes, or other times when I go to the DRC, I know there's gonna be fantastic music there. When I go to India, I know I wanna, you know, make it to the Sufi shrines and see the fantastic um, quality music that's there. So it really depends, um, but I love being surprised and I can't wait to get back out and get surprised again. Yeah, and I'll second that um, about the music in Sudan, Ethiopia. Um, one of my favorite album, maybe my favorite album ever is called Ethiopics. Um, yeah. And it's just amazing. And apparently in Addis Ababa, uh, Addis Ababa, uh, there was like this really swinging scene of clubs. I think in the '60s with you know women with beehive hairdos and and just this great music. It's a combination of of swing with some African rhythms and like some Arabic dissonance. And it, it's not like anything I've heard, but man, it's great. Ethiopics, check it out. Yeah, there's there's at least thirty albums in the Ethiopic series by now. And, uh, you, know, you know, as you, Elon said, it, you know, until recently, it could be hard to find all these things. But now you could find anything instantaneously online. You can find music from all over the world. We have no excuse for being so uneducated here and just have 12 notes in our scale with all these quarter tones. We should all be shaving off the reeds on our accordions. And I know when I played with Pauline Oliveros, she would always keep her digital accordion tuned to Arabic scales where it had way, way more notes. And, and some of the time she didn't tell us this, it, all, it all always seemed like we were out of tune, you know, but she said, I'm just playing the Arabic you know, tuning. Like, well, why didn't you warn us about that? And um, of course in Ethiopian pop music, the tritone C and F sharp is like a consonance. They just play it over and over and over again, breaking all the rules of Western harmony. But if you listen to it long enough, you get it right away. Like, you know, you, you take it in. So uh, what about the, the idea that, you know, exploration is important to music, that music has evolved, would only have become what it is today because people have been traveling, asking questions, joining in, and communicating across the borders of culture. You know, it's, it's, as all of us have found out, it's not so hard to play music with someone who doesn't speak our language. You don't have to talk to someone to be able to musically engage because music has these common elements, even though it has all this diversity. That, you know, is it some kind of universal language or is it more like a bridge between cultures or something that's only evolved because people have mixed ideas and traveled and asked questions all over the place? Questions are coming in. I have to see what they are. Or maybe it's just a comment. Don't ask these impossible questions. Ask something good. I mean, I can take... Go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. No, no. Is that, this is a good one, though. I mean, um, you know, I think exploration and travel, obviously, is, you know, has powered all music. I mean, in America, obviously, the, you know, the forced migration of of African slaves really, as we all know, I mean, that, that, that created everything, you know, from blues to rock to jazz. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I work a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa and you'd be surprised actually how much um, travel and exploration has really, you know, driven everything. I mean, obviously, you know, instruments like, um, I mean, the accordion, you'll find the accordion and harmonium in all sorts of places. I've seen people in Malawi playing it. Um, that was brought in by, you know, by, uh, British missionaries um, hundreds of years ago. Um, but besides that, you also have some, I don't know if I call it exploration, but um, uh, definitely, you know, just exchange. I mean, the, my favorite music in the world is Congolese rumba. 
Um, what's fantastic about that is, you know, obviously, uh, you know, African rhythms went to Cuba. Um, you had, the, you know, the amazing explosion of, Cu of Cuban music. Um, and then during the, um, the colonial wars, um, Che Guevara famously came to uh, DRC with a bunch of Cuban soldiers um, and they got embroiled in all kinds of messy stuff. He actually wrote a diary about it. Um, but the Cuban music came with them to Congo and that mix, you know, so the music that went to Cuba came back with these Cuban soldiers um, and it created this, you know, this rumba music, which basically took over all of Africa, that guitar driven sound that you hear in DRC is now, you'll find it from, you know, from Chad down to South Africa. Um, so it's, you know, it's all sorts of travel and it's not, you know, it's not just, I think, you know, voluntary at times. Um, so it, that's what makes music, you know, at least in my experience, that's what really powers music. Well, the questions and comments are clear from the audience. They're hearing what we're talking about and they say, you guys just off to play something together. And it should be something Ethiopian or Sudanese because that's what you know about. So let's go, let's get the drums going here. Pull up some bones, let's get some bone limpet instruments and you have so many things there. And if not, then just do something, so. Okay, I'll be right back. I'll get the accordion. <laughs> accordion is always useful. All right, I'm gonna put on these headphones for less feedback and we'll see. I'm ready. For the viewers out there, nobody's really figured out how to deal with latency. So we'll have to kind of. <laughs> it's not that bad if only one person is right? responsible for the rhythm. And yeah. everyone else is playing something like latency open. So right. imagine you go into this club, dinosaurs are waking up <laughs> and the jazz musicians are ready. And uh, here we are. To deal with the Zoom lag, I can, I can play nice big notes. Exactly. Don't, don't, worry, don't worry about it. Just go for it. Any keys you like? Just play. Imagine you're in Ethiopia or Sudan. Let's start with Shemsheshe reads here. <laughs> Cheryl, you've got everything there. You know. Yeah. Okay. I'll put this headphone on. Thank you. 
And I think you said it nicely earlier where you uh, said music isn't always about expressing yourself and trying to be different and individual. Something, sometimes it's about trying to belong. It's the sound that helps you belong. And I think that uh, music is one of the things that helps all of this group here belong to the Explorers Club and the notion of exploration and travel and searching for knowledge and mysteries and unknown things around the world. So I hope this really is the first of uh, many Fêtes de la Musique that we are going to have at the club. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing them all in person, like really there sometime very soon, because I see this as a group that really should be in one place at one time someday. So thanks everyone for joining. Anyone have any final words? I think we're supposed to stop around now. So. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Anne, Alex, uh, Luis, putting it all together. Thanks all of you who have been listening and commenting and asking. And, uh, we were happy to be here tonight. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you.